Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the Selmer Super Action 80 series, the original Super Action 80 series. Now the Super Action 80 came after the Mark 7. I may, or as you can see, I'm a Super Action 80 player, at least soprano, and I got Mark 7 altos and tenors. The 7s only came out on alto and tenor, though they're rumored to be like three sopranos with 7 on it. And some just a couple berries and bases with them, but for the most part, it was only alto and tenor. Now, at the Super Action 80, the Mark 7 had a lot of people who didn't really like it. One, it was a heavy horn, it was a very heavy horn because the ribs were thicker, wider than other horns. Two, they also had additional posts, like if you look at the right hand table keys, each table key had their own post. This created a more even feel between the two keys. But those posts and additional ribs add weight. And you would get that all throughout the horns. You have the three point bell brace adding weight. And there's a load of things that add weight to it. At the end of this video, if you take a look at my Mark 6 versus Mark 7 analysis, I think I have two videos where we go over weight, we take a look at different the way they're designed, cone hole size, all the additional ribbing and all that stuff, that'll give you a better idea of why the seven is so much more heavier than six. Now the Super Action 80 alto and tenor has most of the same design concepts as the Mark seven, though of course it has smaller table keys. It also has some thinner ribbing throughout, I do believe, but it also brought on additional things. For instance, let's take a look at a few pictures here. What I want to show you briefly here is the evolution of the left-hand table keys. What we're looking at here is the Selmer balanced action. As you can see, the B-flat, it's actually fixed. It doesn't tilt. And if you look at the key post for each of the keys, you'll see each of the posts or each of the ball has the pivot heads are offset. And this is the easiest way to do it back then as we evolved. Now we have a Mark VI table key. Now we have the low B flat pivot key and it pivots down. And if you look on the top left, you can see the pivot heads are mostly in line now. Or look at the G sharp pearl. The G sharp pearl doesn't change size in the next one. The other table keys do. Now what we have here is the Mark 7 table key. Now myself, I own an alto and a tenor. My first pro horn was a Mark 7, the second one was a superb one from Cuff. But here we can see the extremely elongated width-wise of the table keys. They don't change in the height, they just change in the width. And as I mentioned before, if you go to the end of this video, I have some links to comparisons between the Mark 6 and Mark 7 horns, which also goes in detail in the table keys. And the if you put your pinky where the rollers are for the two middle keys, the pivot is just fine. The trouble is the key touch itself is so large that the feel and the pressure varies greatly. Of course, depending upon the size of your hand, you can easily hit the um, guide on the side with the inside of your palm when you go to reach for the low B flat. Ironically, you could take a Selma USA horn, one of the Omega ones, and you could take th that key work and swap it onto the Mark 7 with a little bit of modification, and it would work just fine. Now you notice the size difference. Now going to the Super Action 80 now, once again, they shrunk the table keys. Um, just look at the G sharp key there. And you can see that they shrunk it back down because people do not like the large table keys. And I mentioned, even though I've been an owner of a Mark 7 since, I don't remember, 1981 or something, I will say that the table keys can get clunky. Uh, they are large, the horn is heavy. You know, having a six also myself and super action 80s in the past and cough horns, you know, I, I have to admit that it is clunky and heavy. Most people say, oh, it's not a problem. Well, you know. another invention of the super action 80 was what's called um, spring plugs. And I'll show you a picture right now. What this is, this is the register key, as you have back here. As you can see on the top and the bottom, they're both the same. The bottom, you can see this plug with a long shaft on it. And there's a spring there. And on the top part of the key, you can see this plug pushed in all the way. This concept was in order to create a consistent feel 
for the drag of the pivot screw on these plugs. But over time, what would happen is the springs would get weaker and then you would just get a jiggling and it wouldn't really work right. Uh, so it was a good concept, but people didn't like that with the Super Action 80. Now, I don't have a Super Action 80 Alto or Tenor anymore, but if we take a look at some pictures, we can go through some pictures of them real briefly. So this is a Super Action 80 Alto, as you can see, I've had in my picture guide. It really looks like a 7 for the most part, except the table keys. You know, and the, some of the ribs are a little bit smaller down here, thinner, to reduce weight a little bit. As an adjuster screw down here on the low B key. But for the most part, it is really like a 7, just taking away the things that people really didn't like about the 7 and added those springs for some odd reason. You'll see when it says Super Action 80, it won't have a series on it because at that time, I don't think they knew they were going to have a series 2 or 3. So it just has 80 Super Action on it. But the same build quality as a 7, or maybe a little bit better, depending upon your perspective. Also, the later 7s didn't have any engraving. The Super Action 80 brought about engraving again. For the most part, it looks just like a 7, 3-point bell brace. A large rib for the body part of it. And a large rib for the bell part of it. Some large ribs here. And the right-hand table keys are, the posts are on a larger rib also just like the seven. The same type of rods for the left-hand table keys. You can see the rib here is not as big as it was on the seven, I believe. Wish I still had a Super Action 80. I would do a comparison of seven to the Super Action 80. But let's go to Somers' website because they have a really good review, their own review of the Super Action 80. Now we're gonna take a quick look at the Selmer France website. They have some good blogs in there and one of them is about Super Action 80. So let's go right over there and take a look. So here we are, we are on the website. History notes number 12, the Super Action 80. Now they have this person here, Doug, Douglas Pfeiffer, talks about the last historic sexual made the house of sound with the Super Action 80. And then later on, the two and the three. Look at the old pictures there. The old days. And they had windows to light and no light bulbs. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about the last historical model which Selmer Paris produced, the Super Action 80. Super Action 80 prototypes started showing up in the late 1979, around the 304,000 serial number range. Test production runs showed up in the early 312,000 range in the spring of 1981. Full production began in April. For the Tenor and the Alto, production ran from about 316,000 to 383,000. The Sopranos started at about 327,000. That's interesting because my soprano is 333,000. And then continued to 390,000. For baritone, production started at 319,000 and continued even further until about 432,000. There was no Super Action 80 production of Sopranos or basses. Both of these types skipped the Mark 7 and the Super Action 80 model and moved from the Mark 6 directly to the Super Action 80 Interesting series. information. For the Sopraninos, this change was made around 426,000, and for the bases, it happened around 435,000. There were roughly 69,000 Super Action 80 saxophones built, including about 8,000 Sopranos, 35,000 Altos, 22,000 Tenors, and about three... I remember going to a... Um... Soul and Samo Festival here in the rich part of town. And all the players from over there had Selmer Paris horn sixes or Super Action 80s, you name it. 1,800 baritones. They were finished as follows. Lacquer, 63,000 units. Silver plate, 5,500 units. Lacquer bodies with silver plated keys, 2,100 units. And gold plate, only about 50 units were produced. This was the first model for which all the U.S. market saxophones were engraved, lacquered, and set up in France prior to shipment. Interesting information. A black tinted lacquer was offered, but only about 120 Super Action 80 examples were finished this way. 
roughly 40 altos, 70 tenors, and a small handful of sopranos and baritones. This episode concludes the model-by-model -model overview of the Selmer History Notes video series. Thank you so much for all of your support. And under underneath this website, uh, the verbiage of what he was talking about. Prototypes started showing up around 304,000. Test production around 312,000. Soprano started at 327, minus 333. No, no Super Action 80 production suffering on bases. So it's all right there in the information. As I mentioned, one of the rumors out there is the Super Action 80 Soprano, especially the earlier ones, were the same body mandrel as the Mark VI. If anyone in Southeast Michigan has a Mark VI Soprano, um, drop me a note in the comments or something. Maybe you can come over for like an hour. We can compare an early Super Action 80 to a Mark VI. I got Super Action 80. I just don't have a Mark VI. Anyways, I hope you like this. Give a thumbs up, like, subscribe, and we'll see you later.